Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. It's not often that we hear about muzzleloading being in the media, but I'm excited to share with you that the History Channel has just debuted Mountain Man Ultimate Marksman, a new series kind of focusing and, and talking about antique arms and their practicality in a fun new kind of reality TV show shooting competition, which is neat to see. We don't see shooting sports in America getting promoted a whole lot, so uh, it's always nice when something does come up. I'm excited to share with you today. We're talking with Eddie Davenport. Eddie's been on the show now uh, a few times, I think. I, I can't quite recall, but Eddie was on the first premiere episode that just aired last week, if you're listening, in November. November 2022. We're going to talk to him a little bit about the show, what it was like behind the scenes, and what it feels like to compete on national television with antique arms, including what we believe to be a Thompson Center Hawken, kind of a classic for contemporary muzzleloading. We've talked with Eddie about his story in muzzleloading and competition muzzleloading a little bit in the past. Check out that episode of the podcast where we dive a little bit deeper into that. But if you're just listening to this new episode now and haven't heard about Eddie, he's been competing since he was 13 years old. His family has been shooting competitively with muzzleloaders for a couple generations now. And Eddie has been active in the North-South Skirmish Association for many years now really since since he was 13 there, uh, winning several national titles, both individually and with the teams that he has shot with over the years. That being said, the Mountain Men Ultimate Marksman competition was kind of a new level of competition for Eddie that changed how he's kind of thinking about muzzleloading competition moving forward and presented us, uh, its own set of new challenges. So if you haven't heard about the show, Mountain Men Ultimate Marksman is hosted by trained welder, outdoor enthusiast, and three-time Survivor contestant Colby Donaldson and world champion shooter Mark Romano. The eight-part series tests some of the world's top marksmen, including Eddie, and Mark's women by using centuries-old historical weapons like primitive knives, bows, and firearms. Competitors will navigate several distance, precision, and obstacle challenges, each designed and based off of the history of the American frontier. It's a showdown that will put their weapons knowledge, accuracy skills, and unique techniques to the ultimate test with competitors on a mission to earn the title of Ultimate Marksman and win 10 grand. Hey everyone, I'm Eddie Davenport. I'm the History Channel's Mountain Men's Ultimate Marksman. And I'm here today, I guess, with Ethan has me on to talk about the show and some other stuff that's going on. So man, I I kinda had an idea that that you and some other friends kind of in future episodes might be on the show. Um, but when I first started to get, you know, some information uh, from the History Channel about this, man, I could not be more excited uh, for you. And as I was watching the press screener, man, I, I, I was rooting for everybody, but it was so cool to see all of this happen and kind of see my assumptions about it going through and playing out that you were on the show. You kind of disappeared for a little while and you came back. Uh, what was it like to be on the History Channel? What was that process like? One, it's been a whole surreal experience. The uh, the interviews to actually get one to get picked and go out there and then to compete with all this. It's it, it's it's fantastic. I mean, look, I'm not going to downplay the fact like winning ten thousand dollars, like I said, at the end shooting a gun is just the most awesome experience in my life. But I they they flew me out to Montana on this beautiful ranch, and I got to you know spend some time on this ranch and just see this, these beautiful sights of America, basically on their dime was. <laughs> I mean, that's it was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> so is this the largest pot you've taken home from a shooting match? Then is that safe? Oh, to say? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't think a couple of pounds of powder here and there at a rendezvous count. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of, kind of shrinks a little bit when you're talking about this scale. So how did, you know, perhaps somebody else listening is interested in, in maybe being on the show or being on future shows. How did they, how did they find you? You know, how did that process start? And, and, you know, you had a couple interviews, maybe this is behind the curtain a little bit, mm -hmm. but was that intimidating for you? So, from my understanding, people could have applied to that if you went to their like their website and you could see that the show was coming up or something uh, like okay. this. I didn't do that. Uh, they reached out to me. Uh, one of the other competitors on the show uh, actually is a friend of mine that gave them my name, and the production company reached out to me through social media and did the interviews. And yes, they were intimidating because I've never done like an acting pitch, and so I kind of had to like sell myself on the camera, and it was it was interesting. Wow! So you had to be a shooter as well as an actor to do this. 
Yeah, not not so much like acting because like the, this is like everything you saw was me. There is no right. There was no second <laughs> takes. It's like what I said. If I if I fumbled through a line, I fumbled through a line. Right. If I if I said a maybe a if I, if I said something in anger, it's it, it stayed. <laughs> <laughs> So from when they first reached out to you, to you being out there shooting and filming, what was that timeline like? Was that a few months or was it like weeks? For myself, it was probably about a month and a half. Okay. Um, I know you're friends with um, Bradley. Yeah, yeah. And he told me on set that it was about uh, three months. Uh, okay. The question I have for you is, who are you rooting for, me or Bradley? You know, I was sitting in there. I was I was even keeled. <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, especially <laughs> since this is public, you know, I'm rooting for all of my friends that might be on the show. So anybody out there that might be in a future episode, I'm rooting for you. Uh huh. Nice answer. <laughs> I can play this game a little bit. <laughs> I might be a hillbilly <laughs> here, but. <laughs> sure. So you know, what was it like being on the set then? I'm. I have to assume that you guys were like, you guys weren't camped in like tents or anything, but were you like staying in cabins? You know, was it a relaxed atmosphere or was it, you know, kind of serious when the cameras were off? You know, you're still sitting there mm -hmm. with your competitors. You're all going for the 10 grand here. Um, you know, was it, so, was it cool or was it a little tense? Yeah. So, um, no, we, we actually didn't camp on set. Um, they, they did have like the art production team stayed on set, I think. Uh, they had us in hotels, so it was pretty nice. And mm -hmm. our days were really long. We started filming at like 8.30 in the morning. We would get done at dark, which out there is like, you know, 8, 9 o'clock at night. Wow. Um, but honestly, um, even though we all knew what was at stake, like it was pretty jovial between us. I mean, we were all laughing and joking with each other. Uh, like whenever someone was like messing up, we would all tell like, if, you know, if they say they had a bad round or like, if they were mad at themselves, we were talking, I was like, Hey, like shake it off. Like, you, you know, you're doing like, we're trying to give each other encouragement. It was kind of like walking through a round like, you know, a woods walk or like a competition or like, you know, we're all competing against each other, but we're going to try to help you be at your best. And mm -hmm. regardless of $10,000 at the end. Right. Right. So you, you said that kind of the crew stayed on site. Were they as, you know, excited about, you know, the antique arms and like the muzzleloading aspect of this, or, or was it just kind of a, another day in the life for them? You know, were they kind of geeking out with you along mm -hmm. the way? Uh, so some of them definitely were. Um, I know some of them, the production company had been involved in, in my understanding of the previous um, history channel competition, the, the, the top shot competition. Mm -hmm. And so I think they were used to this style of thing, even though the, the mountain man marks ultimate marksman show is not like connected to top shot. Right. It is, it is, we were competing with these cool guns. And so the crews were familiar with around a shooting competition. Uh, but some of them like legit were like really like I talked to some of them like behind the scenes, mm -hmm. like, you know, between like stuff like, you know, that you have to set up the competition, obviously set up the stage. And they some of them were talking to me and they were just like, you know, geeking out of the fact that we we own and shoot these really cool old guns. And because like some of them were like, hey, they own a Glock or they own a shotgun, they own a hunting rifle. Well, like, yeah, we own these antique firearms. And we hunt with them. And it was just like it was blowing their mind and stuff like that. That's cool. So you're able to kind of share you know kind of the good word about muzzling yeah. with folks who yeah, might not have considered cool. it <laughs> cool and there's one guy at least that was on set that i talked to that i'm trying to talk into coming out to north carolina to go hunt, um, like next year to go black powder hunting with me it was kind of a short notice for him this year but we're trying to plan a hunt next year to come out oh that's so cool i, I love to hear that where like you're going out there and you're going to be on TV, you know, in front of, I don't know how many folks, but then you're still <laughs> behind the scenes, like encouraging people to get into it, you know, at the show. I think that's really cool. You know, what about the hosts? Were they, are they kind of muzzleloading enthusiasts or is this, you know, or are they, are they kind of in the modern side of things and then, you know, just dipping their toes mm -hmm. into it with the show? So Colby, uh, he, uh, he's messed with black powder stuff. He's done. That's actually how he knows Mark Romano. Okay. Uh, through the stuff that he did uh, on his actual his home range, they would all the time bring shooters out there to show people these things and like basically run people through competitions on his own his home ranch and just show these cool things they do. Uh, Mark, he's a world champion cowboy action shooter. No, so yeah. he's very familiar with these old guns. And while, you know, cowboy actions, a single action shooting is not the same as muzzleloading. It's still using antique firearms, at least antique designs. Yeah. And so he's definitely, he, he was definitely super like, 
like all into this. Don't not saying Colby wasn't. Colby 100 percent is the shoot. Colby's a great ambassador for the shooting world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, it, Mark was kind of my personal hero. I knew who he was the second he walked on stage. Uh, he walked on set, and like it was really cool to meet Colby. I, I can't take that down. He's like, uh, my mother-in-law is very jealous that I met Colby because she was a fan of him on Survivor. Oh, okay. Uh, but for me, it was like meeting a personal hero to meet Mark. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's kind of go through the stages a little bit, if that's okay. You know, yeah, kind of absolutely. starting starting with the first stage. And I have to ask, were these these weren't filmed all in the same day? Is that right? No, okay. no. They they we actually did three days worth of filming. That that they did a really good job of like condensing it down to make it like a single thing. Yeah, I was gonna say it felt like it was one day. <laughs> that was great. I know the results obviously because I won. Like even watching the show, my nerves were like spiking through the roof. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> They did a fantastic job on this editing. I can't wait to see how the other shows look. If like if mine was this good, I can't wait to see how others did, you know? Yeah, I'm excited for when they get some better shots on there, you know? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of the Christmas list this year. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You can send me some coal. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first stage was that like can shooting. And mm-hmm. I, I as a kind of a you know, a young pistol shooter. I was in love with that. Like, I'm going to set that up on my home range and try that a little bit just because that seems like a lot of fun. What yeah. was going through your mind on that? Because you're not necessarily, you know, a, a, you know, dyed in the wool pistol shooter here. Yeah. So because, especially because like my, my real experience of shooting pistols are, you know, like timed accurate shooting with the NSSA yeah. or it's cowboy action where it's fast, um, like, dynamic shooting back and forth not so much aim more instinctive shooting as we're shooting at steel Mm -hmm. uh with this it definitely was a different experience because like it you know like if me and you were shooting a can in the backyard we're trying to hit the can yeah here though if you hit the can it may not go where you want so like you have to like take the chance of do i shoot underneath it and then if i do if it you can't control where it go it goes sometimes because like so it was like it was a really stressful competition because like i don't know where it's going to go when i shoot it and then like i'm sure you saw in the episode i actually dropped around yes Um, you want to talk about anxiety from like spiking through the roof like now i have five rounds to beat melinda and she's a fantastic shot Man, I, I'll have to say, like during that one, I was my I was kind of like, woof, this is <laughs> this is tense. I mean, it's kind of like a a moderate, it's like a, a cowboy dueling tree kind of thing is what was going through yeah. my head. It's like you have to plan not only to hit your shots, but to beat your opponent. And it, it got me excited really for like timed shooting again. I just thought that was so cool. Yeah, we were at the, I had a competition this past weekend with the muzzleloading stuff I usually compete in the NSSA. And we were actually talking, like, is there any way that we can realistically do this with our guns right. and um, get and make it through the rules so it's safe? And we we're like, so we were brainstorming and we had a table because like we had to go shoot. But we're like, right. we're gonna, <laughs> like if we can figure this out, we're going to do it because it, like, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What was the next stage then? Refresh my memory. The next stage was kind of the wood walk where oh, you yeah, were yeah. using the Hawken. Yeah. Yeah, you're shooting that. It, was that a Thompson Center? Did you get a chance to see that percussion hawk in there? I believe I believe it was Thompson Center. Uh if it's not someone like if someone like still shots and get a better part of that, I apologize. I believe it was Thompson Center think like looking at it and it kind of looked like it to to me as well. I I'm sure yeah, some I mean, eagle eyed folks. Of them, the, the lock and stuff had the feel of the Thompson centers, you know, that crisp cut and everything they usually have. What was going through your mind as you were walking into that woods walk? Cause I mean, that's kind of a staple for any mm-hmm. contemporary muzzleloading event is you have kind of a woods walk like that. It might not be timed like this was. So this was like an added layer of stress on there. Right. Yeah. And then um, I'm not sure if they mentioned it in the show or not, but we didn't know the exact distances. Like oh, really? we were told relatively um, cause they didn't want us to like, you know, staying safe they didn't want us to like put point the firearms in unsafe directions so mm-hmm. we were told relatively at each stage where roughly the target will be but we had to find it <laughs> and we didn't know the exact distances of the shots either so like not only are you like time shooting you're having to shoot through that rotating hole which is the bane of my existence apparently <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've got to try to make like, one of those now that's cool yeah, oh yeah it was fun um and then but you're having to find your shot the shots aren't exactly comfortable. I mean, you saw me and Bradley having to like, almost like get on, like 
bend our knees to shoot. Yeah. And then the one sec, I think it was the second or third shot. It was the second say the second one where I'm like looking back and forth, trying to find the target through the branches. Cause the, the hole to shoot through that was probably the size of like a playing card. Really? Man. They're like threading the needle. Like if you're hunting out in the brush or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I will did admit, a good job doing that. <laughs> yeah. I'll admit on, in the episode, I didn't get that it was that small. So that's really interesting to hear and kind of adds a different layer to it. You know, yeah, I, they did a good job showing it on camera. Like it made it look open. Oh, in reality, this was a tiny was shot. So everyone who hit that shot, it, that was a fantastic shot. Wow. That's cool. And it adds kind of an extra layer to it then too. Uh, mm -hmm. What were the, what were the relative distances? It didn't look like you had a whole lot past 50 yards, but I, I, I kind of want to hear about that a little bit. So I think the longest one was about 65 yards. Okay. Uh, and then, like, I think the closest one was maybe 35-ish yards. Well, when you're um, shooting that size it, target, yeah. I mean, that's that's tough at just about any distance, you know, if you're yeah. stretching and, past 25, shoot. And then, of course, the rotating poles and stuff like that, I... Um, the first one I, I missed well and left, which if, um, all the guys that know me for shooting muzzle orders, they're going to laugh at this. It's my historic miss. So the, and what it happens is because like, I, I, you know, I, I jerked the trigger trying to get it through that hole and it was mm -hmm. low and left, which is what I always do. Mm. <laughs> and then we're kind of entering spoiler territory here. So you've, you've already mentioned a little bit, but if you are interested to watch the episode and want to stay as tense as I was watching it. Going into the final stage here, if you haven't watched it, go and watch it and come back to this point. But going into the final stage here, you're shooting a, a Henry lever gun. You know, it's not a mm -hmm. muzzleloader. We'll we'll let that pass here just for the sake of our conversation. <laughs> you know, we can talk about that later, History Channel. You're shooting some dingers with looks like a 44, maybe. This was 45 long coal. Okay. But then they set the the space in front of the targets on fire. What was your thought process? I want to know first, what was your first reaction to that? And then what was your competition shooter mental process going through to get around that? to then shoot as well as you could. So they actually filmed our reaction to that. The, that was a live reaction when they told us it was going to be uh, behind wall of flames. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. So like all of us like going nuts with that. Cause like they, they um, off camera, they would explain the event a little bit more in detail to us. Um, also, cause like, you know, there's a narrator telling it, you guys, we don't have a narrator. So they were telling us the, the rules of competition. They told us in that one, there's going to be a surprise. Okay. And that was the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Man. So, I mean, walk us well, thinking through about that. that it was bit. just, it was, it was intimidating because, um, they, history channel did a really good job of keeping all of us like out of the loop of how, um, of the, and warm stream production, the people that actually produced the show mm -hmm. did a good job of like keeping us out of the loop of what other people are doing. And they, they did request like, Hey, please don't share results. We'll do, we'll do it on camera. Like, you know, trying to make the, gen the reactions genuine, you know, which yeah. makes everything a little bit better. This one, they had us behind like five or six tents inside a car. So we never, uh, we would hear, we would, you could see in the air, the heat shimmer. But we really? had no idea how high this um, wall of flame was going. Like when it got turned on for me, I was like, oh, my God. Because <laughs> like when you're looking at it, like you can see it on camera, like the left, like the first target on the left is about the only one you can see. Everything else is, I mean, if you've ever watched a campfire, you know, all the flame goes up and like opens up and it'll come back together as it's mm -hmm. burning, like with the smoke and stuff. That's what it was doing there. You're shooting, you're looking through a solid wall of flame, hoping there's a, it would open up for a second for you. Wow. And the time so, like, limit you, on you, that you, was just a few minutes. It was actually one minute. One minute. Okay. I, th I think it was one minute. Um, I might be wrong, but I believe it was just one minute because it was a very stressful event. You had to load it, shoot it, and like get accurate shots. <sighs> Man. And then you had kind of the trophy target set at 50 yards. Is that right? Yeah, that, that was a really fun shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was cool. They had it. You got to watch the episode. I won't spoil that one. Uh, let's spoil it. I mean, I, I'm i going to spoil it. It was fun okay. blowing that target up. <laughs> <laughs> if they haven't seen it by now, then um, shame on you. It came out Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> People need to get their priorities straight, right? Yeah. <laughs> Come watch the shooting show, guys. <laughs> All 
I'm Ethan, the host of I Love Muzzleloading. We had some feedback that the ads were a little bit confusing. I want to say that we do have more of the show after the ad break here. These companies really help us keep the lights on and keep the podcast going. So I appreciate you listening to this short ad break. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full-bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Muzzleloader Magazine, the publication for traditional black powder shooters. Since 1974, Muzzleloader has been the leading magazine devoted to traditional black powder hunting and shooting. Each issue is jam-packed with articles on hunting, shooting, gunsmithing, do-it-yourself projects, living history, American history, book and product reviews, and much, much more. Muzzleloader Magazine is the best traditional muzzleloading magazine, bar none. I'd like to thank Jason at Muzzleloader Magazine for his continued support of I Love Muzzleloading and the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. So after you shot that stage, that last stage, you know, you, you will go back to the car and you're sitting there. What, what is that weight like as you're waiting for the other competitors to run through this? Because you were, you were the second person, I think, to shoot it. Nope. I was a third. It was you Melinda, the okay. then Bradley, me, and then it was Jenny. Okay. And, so you only um, had to wait for one person then. Yeah. And I, I had a pretty good idea that I was sort of in the lead because um if anyone shoots steel targets you know you can hear reports sometimes mm-hmm. and we were somewhat hearing dull reports but like there was no guarantee it was that it could have been something else because we're, 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 we're on a live ranch so it could have right. been anything you know um and and everyone's doing a good job coming back and not showing any emotions, stuff like that. Just coming back, being jovial. Like we had, you know, snacks and drinks in the car. So coming back and, you know, it's going right back to our conversation of, you know, listening to some music and um, eating some snacks and just talking. <laughs> so when that was done, you're all standing there in the field together. You know, did you know at that point that you had won or were you suspecting that a little bit? Because looking at you in the video, they didn't necessarily show you a lot, but when they did show you, you weren't, you know, you, you hit it well if you knew. So I was about 90% sure that I okay. had won when they announced it. But there's that little moment of doubt in my head going like, Melinda Melinda did a tear through the muzzleloading section. Yeah. And then as she she's a good shot with a Henry. She's won a championship with a Henry before. And then Jenny, she's an Olympian shooter. Like this may have been out of her discipline because this is, you know, like, like powder rounds and instead of air rifle rounds but i mean marksmanship is marksmanship and the one like i didn't really hear any reports for bradley then looking at the show i kind of understood why he's like i has he put a he asked for a low center you gave him high heat yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah bradley really had a lot to contend with there i was i was feeling that when he was up there man because even in the camera you could see man there's just nothing there yeah. Yeah, that's and tough. it was it, it was tough. <laughs> but yeah, the, the reaction was genuine when they announced it. It was like that little doubt in your head of like, I think I got this, but I'm not sure. Right. And so it was just like that moment of relief. <laughs> <laughs> what did that feel like? You know, you've won some some national titles and things. You know, mm-hmm. you're you're a good shot at home. What did it feel like to go through there and them to say you've just won ten grand? This was like the culmination of all this stuff I've ever done. Like I've worked my entire life to like, get to this level of shooting. Mm-hmm. And like I said in the very beginning, um, I'm not sure if I said this on a private interview or if on, on set because uh, they, they pulled sound bots from stuff that we sent in. Oh, okay. it, like I said, I know I'm good. It's time to prove it. And uh-huh. that's what I went in. I went in with going. It was like, hey, anytime I go into a competition, I go in with the knowledge that I, I can win. And this one was like I went with I went into this competition going, I'm going to win this. Right. But then, like, you meet the people you're going against and, like, you have those nuggets of doubt start coming through you that any shooter has to, like, you you have to push through. Yeah. You have to, like, you know, you, hey, you have to have confidence in your ability. You have to, like, play your own mental game to get through this. And so for me, it was like, 
I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. Nine titles that I've won mean so much to me because, like, they're, they're little nuggets in your hat and say you've done this. Yeah, man. This, th- this, I think is like the best. Ac- I think I'm, I'm putting this as the highest accomplishment I've, I've done. I mean, I have a title of Ultimate Marksman. How cool is that? I mean, that, <laughs> it's really cool. And I think you know, if you shoot a lot of competition, there's a mindset going into that competition. You know, even if it's just friendly, you know, it's kind of a, a familiar range. If you've done it for a long time, you, you kind of know the space, you know, the competitors and you kind of know the parameters, but this uh-huh. was, I mean, just about as close as you can get to them dropping you off in a helicopter saying, here's a muzzleloader and now go win. Yeah, it, that, that was definitely different. <laughs> so the word on the street is you're going to add a new muzzleloader to your collection <laughs> after this with some of your winnings. Can you share what you're going for with this? So there is a few that I'm looking at. Um, oh, a few. Okay. Because um, I'm looking at, I'm kind of narrowing it down. Um, uh-huh. The, the one that's kind of leading the pack, which is, I'm sure it's no secret to anyone who's into like, you know, flintlock rifles is a Jim Kibler kit. Nice. Uh, the main one I'm looking at for them is their Southern mountain rifle because it's based off of a design in Buncombe County, which, um, it's like 20 minutes from my house. So like, why, why should I own the rifle that came out of my County? Yeah, man. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, You'll have to start uh, winning some titles with that one then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a few others that I'm looking at, but I think that's probably going to be the contender just because it kind of it continues that whole line. And I mean, I can use it in friendship this spring if I can get it built in time. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm sure you can. I mean, those things just snap together like a Lego set. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you're do you have any others that you're looking at? I figured you're just going to spend the rest of the money responsibly here, but. You know, not to pry too much into your finances, man, but it, what else, what oh, else no, are you looking at? I, I've been, I, I've made myself a deal that I can get one. And so oh, okay. I've been looking at, so it's either that or, um, kind of going modern, like a precision rifle, but uh, the muzzleloader is probably going to beat out. It's right now, it's probably like, set, um, like 80, 20 in okay. the muzzleloader favor. Okay. I mean, uh, I like long range shooting. So like a precision rifle is kind of on the, the radar, but it's like, it's like so far behind the pack that I think it's about to get lapped. <laughs> <laughs> well, listeners, if you're on Instagram, you need to bug Eddie about this and make sure he gets the <laughs> flintlock. I want DMs. I want his inbox filled. We're going to release his phone number. We're going to make sure that he gets this flintlock, okay? We, we can't have this modern <laughs> precision stuff going. <laughs> like I said, it's okay. I guess it's down up to 8515. Please don't blow up my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get to that 90-10 ratio, folks. It's, it's, uh, I'll be honest with you, man. It's most likely going to be that. It's just okay. I've been a fan of those guns since I was a kid, like that style of gun. And then like when he started making his kits, they're, they're fantastic, man. I mean, yeah. I've never heard one bad word against their, their kit. And with that, you know, where can folks find you, man? We're kind of getting close to the end of our time here. Where can folks, you know, kind of continue to follow your muzzleloading and your mm-hmm. and your competition shooting adventures here? So the easiest place to probably find me these days is on Instagram. I'm Curry Tuck Kid. So C-U-R-R-I-T-U-C-K underscore kid. It's actually my, uh, my cowboy name when I shoot sass. So that's, that's probably the easiest way of finding me these days. Um, my other social medias, um, well, I have, I have a Facebook, but, um, it's my personal one's kind of locked down, but I'm, I'm, I'm a, well, I actually, I can say this. I'm a moderator on your Facebook page. So if you yeah, have yeah. questions, I can answer you there. Uh, Twitter, I'm, I'm on it. Um, most of the stuff I do on Twitter is actually stuff through like mental health side with my actual job, yeah. interacting with like other professionals. Uh, I will answer gun stuff in there all day long because I'm not shy about who I am. Yeah. But like, if you want like actual stuff, like the most of the time I'm sharing like pictures of results and guns and like all the competitions, it's mostly Instagram. Yeah. Well, cool. I'll have a link to, to Eddie's Instagram, at least there in the description for this episode and with the blog post that goes with it. I love muzzleloading.com. So people can find you with the tap they don't have to type out Kuratuk Kid it's a long name it's a good name though I love that <laughs> Kuratuk Kid America's Ultimate Marksman you know I mean that's got a ring to it you know I, yeah. I can see that <laughs> we have to we have to get a t-shirt made <laughs> we do you know seriously if you want to put your face on a t-shirt I will wear it <laughs> I mean I have I have your designs tattooed on my leg so it's only fair that's right oh, we needed to get a flash of that where where, where were the camera angles there history channel come on
I'd like to thank Eddie once again for sharing his experience with us. It's really exciting for me, and I, I truly mean this, to see uh, friends like Bradley and Eddie going on to this program and enjoying themselves. I know that you know sometimes this can be kind of nerve-wracking for people to go into a program like this and be filmed, um, but I'm really passionate and really excited to see Muzzleloading get a little bit of airtime here on a show like this. It's nice to see the History Channel feature muzzleloading of all things, you know, when it, when it comes to history and their line of programming. I'd like to thank Olivia at the History Channel uh, for helping coordinate all of this, and I, I do truly appreciate it. If you'd like to catch the rest of the episodes in Season 1 of the Mountain Man Ultimate Marksman, you can tune in on Thursdays at 9.30 p.m. ET and PT. Uh, there are seven episodes left. There are eight episodes total, including Eddie's episode, which aired last week so you want to check those out you can check out uh, the links in the description below uh, to check out some of the promotional material for the episode uh, with the history channel um, or you can find it i imagine on your tv guide um, and uh, and schedule plan your dvr maybe and uh, check out the episode cheer on eddie cheer on bradley and cheer on the rest of the muzzleloading enthusiasts that are on the program i think it's really neat to see we don't just have uh you know normal regular people that don't necessarily care about muzzleloading you know no fault of theirs uh, being pulled into shows like this we have people that are passionate about it and passionate about the community being pulled in for something like this which is really great it's uh, some good press i think for muzzleloading and the future of the sport and community so i'm ethan i love muzzleloading thank you so much for watching we'll catch you next time